channel and welcome to Spooktober on my channel where for the month of October I'm going to be dedicating a lot of it to murder mysteries and to spooky stuff and paranormal occurrences and just a bunch of cool creepy stuff for the month of October. I also want to give a huge shout out to Jacob for doing my intro and that's what you guys just saw right now and I'm super super happy and excited for it. I hope that you guys like it and if you do, comment down below what you think of it because I'm completely in love with it and he did an amazing job. I'll link his Instagram down below just in case you want to show him some love, give him a follow, want him to do something for you because he's incredibly talented in photography. And I was just in a music video that he made. He was the artist in it. So if you want to check that out, I'll link that down below too. So I'm just going to hop right into the video and start off by saying, disclaimer, this is a very, very messed up story. So I just wanted to give a little trigger warning before I go into it. But this is the story about the DC snipers. And for those of you who don't know, the DC snipers were these two men who went from Washington State all the way to Washington DC just randomly killing people and there was a goal in mind but I'll get into that later and I actually first heard about the DC snipers from Justin's dad a little very interesting fact about their new home in Washington because they moved from New Hampshire to Washington. Their property in Bellingham is where the DC snipers did target practice, which is completely crazy. And that's what Justin's dad told me. So I looked into it and the story is just completely insane. So I'm just gonna hop into the story. So the main person that we're gonna be talking about, which was the main mind of the DC sniper killings, also known as the Beltway snipers, was John Muhammad. John Muhammad was born in Louisiana and he lived with his aunt because his mother died when he was four years old. He got married right out of high school, had a kid and then joined the National Guard. When he was in the National Guard, he decided that he actually wanted to join the army. And that's where he ended up moving to Washington state. And that's where he met Mildred Muhammad. So John Muhammad was in the military for 16 years and he's what is known as a sharpshooter. So he didn't have the title of sniper, but he was known as a sharpshooter and everyone said he was a really good shot. Before John Muhammad went on this killing spree, he was known as a really good man and a really good father. When he got married to his wife, Mildred, they were living in Washington state and they had three kids together. While they were married, John Muhammad actually got deployed and when he came back from war, he was completely different. He became really reserved and just quiet and pensive and Mildred Muhammad actually said that she didn't understand what was wrong with him and she tried to tell him to get help, but that just pushed him away even further. He started to become very emotionally and verbally abusive to his wife and he started to cheat on her. Mildred actually recalls him saying this right here. When we got into arguments, he said, well, you know, it's only a matter of mind over matter. I said, what does that mean? He said, I don't mind because you don't matter. That's just red flags all over the place. She was definitely in an abusive relationship and an abusive marriage. And because of that, she decided that enough was enough and that if he was gonna act single, then he could be single. So she filed for a divorce. After she filed for a divorce, that's when Muhammad's evil side really started to come out. She would recall being asleep and then hearing the front door open and hearing him go up the stairs to her room and just stand there listen to her breathe and then leave the house. He would just do a bunch of these little weird things that rose a lot of red flags for her and she felt like she was in real danger. One of her friends actually said, you know you got married to a trained killer, right? Mildred never thought that he would do anything to hurt her at all. So it wasn't something that she was worried about up until his evil side started to come out and he was becoming a real danger to her. Because of this, she got a restraining order and it was a lifetime restraining order, which is very, very rare. After she got the restraining order, John Muhammad went to her house. He pretty much told her, 
You are my enemy now, and I will kill you. Though they had the restraining order, he still had to have visitation with his kids. So they set it up that one of their mutual friends would give the kids rides to Mildred's house, then to John's house, and then back to Mildred's house, and so on and so forth. And one day when it was John's turn with the kids, they got dropped off to his house and they never came back. John Muhammad had kidnapped his kids for 18 months. She had gone to the police. They told her they couldn't do anything because he had every right because those were his kids too. So John Muhammad took his kids to Antigua, and I think that's somewhere in the Caribbean or something, don't quote me on that, but the kids just thought they were on vacation. And one day he came home with a young man, 17 year old, Lee Malvo, and this was his accomplice in the DC sniper killings. He told his children that Lee Malvo was their brother and they accepted him as a brother. They had no idea that their father was grooming this young boy to help him carry out 17 awful murders. Eventually, while he's in Antigua, he gets in trouble with immigration and they send him back to the United States. And as soon as he gets back to the United States, the kids are apprehended and sent back to Mildred. Just imagine being away from your kids and your mom for 18 months. I can't even imagine how scary that must have been for Mildred to think that she was never gonna see her kids again. After this happened, Mildred relocated to Washington, DC. And these are really where the events just really start to unfold terribly. While Mildred relocates to Washington DC, Muhammad lives in a homeless shelter where Lee Malvo and his mother are actually staying at. Somehow they made it to the United States. I don't have the information on that, but they made it to the United States and they were living in a homeless shelter in Bellingham, Washington which that's where Justin's parents live, is in Bellingham. And there he was trying to build like this army sort of thing in the homeless shelter trying to recruit people to help him on this mission to kill a bunch of people. So John Muhammad and Lee Malvo did a bunch of target practicing because remember John was already a trained sniper or sharpshooter but he was a really good shot so now he was teaching Lee and starting February 16th 2002 they were going to create a reign of terror through the United States. The first death on February 16th 2002 was, uh, was in Tacoma Washington, 21-year-old Kenya Cook opened the door of her aunt's house and when she opened it she got shot and killed. Cook's aunt was really really good friends with Muhammad's ex-wife Mildred and she had actually encouraged her to get a divorce so that was definitely a crime of passion. John Muhammad's goal in all these killings was to kill his wife and make it look not suspicious by killing all the other people and then getting custody of his children. So what they did is they tricked out John Muhammad's 1990 Chevy Caprice. They shot from the car's trunk, so it wasn't obvious that there was people with guns just shooting people. They made a hole in the trunk and that's where they stuck the gun out and just killed people. One month after the first killing in Tucson, Arizona, 60 year old Jerry Taylor is playing golf and he gets shot and killed. Two months after that in Denton, Texas, 37 year old Billy Dillon is shot and killed while doing yard work. Three months after that in Hammond, Louisiana, 52 year old John Gaeta is shot in the neck while he's outside of a shopping mall and he survives. A week later after he was in recovery he actually got an apology letter from Lee Malvoy which to me is just really weird that he felt the need to apologize for shooting someone in the neck when they have already killed so many other people but it kind of makes you think if maybe Lee because he was groomed into doing this if he actually didn't want to do it at all. After this death, it was rapid fire. On September 21st in Atlanta, Georgia, Million A. Wander Marion is executed while standing in a parking lot. And that same day in Montgomery, Alabama, 21-year-old Kelly Adams and 52-year-old Claudine Parker are shot while they're working. They worked in a convenience store and they were shot while they were getting robbed. Claudine Parker died, but Kelly Adams survived. Two days later in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 45-year-old Hong Im Ballinger and sh is shot and killed while she's walking to her car. And at this point, none of the police officers or anyone is connecting the dots because they seem so random. None of the targets have anything in common and all of these killings were just random. On October 2nd, 
they reached Washington, D.C. And as you can see, they're getting closer and closer to where Muhammad's ex-wife Mildred lives. On this day, 55-year-old James Martin was shot and killed in the parking lot of a grocery store. And a couple hours after that, 39-year-old James Buchanan was shot while mowing his lawn. 31 minutes later, cab driver Prem Kumar Walliker is shot while filling up gas. And minutes later, 34-year-old Sarah Ramos was shot and killed while she was reading a book and waiting for the bus. He was just going out and killing a bunch of innocent people. And during this time, everyone was scared to just go out to fill up gas, to, to go to the store, to be anywhere where it could be public because they didn't know who was doing these killings. They didn't know what the target was they didn't know anything so it was really scary for the people in Washington DC at this time knowing that there were so many people getting killed just while doing everyday things. It got so bad that the only way people felt comfortable filling up gas was that gas stations in Washington DC started putting up tarps up everywhere all around the gas stations so that even if they were there, they wouldn't have a good shot at people. Just imagine that fear that you would feel just walking out of your house, knowing that there was random killers on the loose and gas stations covered in tarps because people just didn't feel safe. Before the day ended, two more people were shot and killed. 25-year-old Lori Ann Lewis Rivera was killed while she was vacuuming her car at a gas station. And 72-year-old Pascal Charlotte was just shot and killed while he was walking around Washington, D.C. There were six dead in less than 24 hours. After this horrific day, people would park and just run into a building. Everyone was scared to be out in the public. And the only thing all these deaths had in common is that it was just took one shot. There were multiple shots towards people in one general area. It was just one shot and then moving on to the next target. On October 4th, 43-year-old Caroline Sewell was shot in the chest in a parking lot. And on October 7th, the most horrific one of these crimes that made it known that no one was safe was 13-year-old Iran Brown was shot in the chest while going to middle school. He thankfully survived, but at that crime scene is where police found a tarot card, specifically the death card, and on it was written, call me God. On October 9th, 53-year-old Dean Harold Myers was killed and shot while pumping gas. And on October 11th, 53-year-old Kenneth Bridges was also shot while filling up gas. On October 14th, 47-year-old Linda Franklin was shot at a Home Depot parking lot. On October 19th, 37-year-old Jeffrey Hopper was shot in the parking lot of a steakhouse and he thankfully survived. After this attempted murder, police found a letter in the forest demanding $10 million and threatening children. On October 22nd, 35-year-old Conrad Johnson was shot while standing outside of his bus because he was a bus driver. All these killings were getting closer and closer and closer to Muhammad's ex-wife Mildred and his children even talk about being scared and wondering who could be doing all of this stuff and never once suspected that it could be their father. He wanted these other shootings to cover up the motive in his crime because he thought, well, if my ex-wife is killed, but all these people are also killed, they're gonna think that it's just another victim of a serial killer. And he thought that they would not suspect him. Luckily, on October 24th, 2002, the police knew that they were looking for a 1990 Chevy Caprice that was navy blue or dark blue and they finally found it and they finally found it at a rest stop the police set up a perimeter around this rest stop just in case because they thought it was going to be a shootout and that there were going to be lots of fatalities because they had already savagely murdered so many other people luckily when the police approached them they were asleep they had no idea that they had been surrounded and they arrested them without a struggle on september 2003 john muhammad was sentenced to death and in november 2009 died of lethal injection. Lee Malvo was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And that's it for the DC Snipers video. I want to give a shout out to my sources. I used Wikipedia, Crime Watch Daily, and the Sofa King podcast to give me all the information I needed to really understand what the, the DC Snipers, aka Beltway Snipers, murders were all about. I really recommend, if you're really interested in the story, to watch the Crime Watch Daily videos on it, which I'll link down below, because in it they actually interview Muhammad's ex-wife Mildred and she is so strong and so powerful and just hearing her talk was really incredible with how she's handled everything and they also interviewed his children. I find it incredibly creepy and interesting 
when I go visit Justin's family's house and to know the history behind what had happened there is just really wild to me. I want to give a huge thanks to everyone who takes the time to watch my videos and is subscribed to me. You are not taken for granted and I can't wait to read 500 subscribers so I could do this amazing giveaway for you guys. I wouldn't be able to do this without your support. I can't wait to keep doing Spooktober and I'm gonna constantly try to upload all throughout October. If you've made it this far, I just wanna explain that I started a new job and I'm working 10 hour days Monday through Friday. I don't get home until six o'clock and by the time I get home, I am super duper tired, but I don't wanna stop making these videos for you guys because I'm really passionate about true crime and I'm also really passionate about my YouTube channel. Just bear with me if you don't hear from me for a little bit. I'm gonna try my hardest to upload consistently. It just gets really hard. Once again, I just really appreciate you guys and I hope you enjoyed this video. Like, comment, and subscribe. Bye.